Um, so our next speaker is Gustavo Ferreira from the Open University in the UK. And he is going to talk about multiply connected wandering domains of meromorphic functions, internal dynamics and connectivity. Please. Okay. Thanks for, for the introduction. And so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity to, to give this talk. And second of all, I'd like to apologize because I've realized very, very recently that some of the results that were promised in the abstract are wrong. And so in this talk, we will actually see how and why they're wrong and how actually uh, the internal dynamics of multiple connected wandering domains is far wilder than what uh, we thought it would be. So without further ado, let's start talking about where we came from. So we, We've all heard before that uh, we, we have periodic and pre-periodic FATO components, which were classified by FATO himself back around 1920. And the, the key of this classification is that the dangereau wolf theorem allows us to say that a periodic FATO component is, is always either an attracting domain or, or a parabolic domain or a rotation domain or a Baker domain. And we've seen examples of all of these in the previous talks right so for wandering domains we have recent work by anna and vaso and nuria and phil and gwyneth on how to classify simply connected wandering domains and what they did was they took uh, their orbit of wandering domains uh, used riemann mappings to send everything to the unit disk and so they got and so they got uh, a sequence GN uh, of self maps of the disk, which form a non autonomous sequence. But the Riemann maps uh, preserve the hyperbolic metric between the disk and the wandering domains. And so, an, a, a very natural thing to do would be to uh, look at the long term behavior of the hyperbolic distance in the wandering domains between pair of points, between pairs of, of orbits, right? And so they got the following. Uh, if u is a simply connected wandering domain of an entire function f, then either every uh, every pair of orbits uh, gets closer, closer and closer together, right? So we say that the domain is contracting, or every pair of orbits gets closer and closer together, but not too close. There always remains some distance between them, or uh, eventually everyone stays the same distance apart. Right, and we call these contracting, semi-contracting, and eventually isometric uh, wandering domains, respectively. They also studied uh, how orbits behave relative to the boundary. So we have uh, a simply connected wandering domain of the entire function f. Then everyone, uh, every point in your wandering domain does one of the following. Right, either everyone's going towards the boundary or everyone stays away from the boundary, or everyone alternatively goes to the boundary and stays away from the boundary, right? So this third case is called oscillating. And so if you combine uh, these two uh, classifications, you get nine possible behaviors, right? And some of them are very familiar to us, right? So for instance, if the domain is contracting, so every pair, every pair of orbits gets closer and closer together, but at the same time stays away from the boundary, then this looks a lot like an attracting domain. And in, have, and in fact, uh, we already had uh, examples of these three cases here, uh, attracting parabolic and Ziegel domains that were obtained by uh, via Herman's method of lifting uh, self maps of the puncture disk, right? So they're wandering domains that look like per uh, periodic FATO components. But you're still left with lots of uh, possible cases with no known examples. And what they did was they constructed examples of all of these. And so, in fact, all nine possible types are realizable. So now let's talk about multiple connect wandering domains. Uh, so if the function is entire, then every multiple connected factor component is a wandering domain, and they all go to infinity. Um, 
And we say that a multiple connect running domain or henceforth an MCWG U has eventual connectivity K, which may be finite or infinite, if eventually uh, every UN, right? UN is the factor component that contains the nth iterate of U, uh, has connectivity K. And we know that for entire functions, then every MCWG has a well-defined eventual connectivity, which is either two or infinity. We also know, thanks to Berg, Valerie, Ripon, and Stallard, uh, Gwyneth talked a lot about this on Monday, so I'll just skip through it, that uh, in such wandering domains, every open subset is eventually blown up, right? So the iterates of every open subset eventually cover a large-ish annulus. We have a sequence of very large absorbing annuli inside the wandering domains, right? So everyone eventually enters one of these annuli. And inside these large annuli, F looks a lot like uh, a monomial. For meromorphic functions, things get uh, a bit more complicated, right? So we know due to Baker, Coates, and Lou uh, back in 1990 that any eventual connectivity is possible, uh, right? Finite or infinite, bounded or unbounded, you name it, it exists. And in case of the internal dynamics, and things are even more complicated, and, and you don't really know much about it. And this is what we want to talk about today. Right, so how would we classif classify multiple connect wandering domains? Well, uh, well, we'll start with trying to emulate what they did for simple connected wandering domains, right? So we swap out the Riemann maps for uniformizing maps, which are locally isometric, but have infinite degree, right? And they are not isometric in general, but only locally isometric, but we could still hope to, uh, to show that whatever, whatever happens up here in the unit disk also happens down here on our wandering domains, right? And if we could uh, prove that somehow, we would have uh, a classification theorem that would look like this, right? Either every pair of orbits in your wandering domain gets closer, closer and closer together in a hyperbolic sense, or every pair of orbits gets close but not too close, or eventually everyone stops getting close together and stays at a fixed distance apart, right? So we would have exactly the same thing as we had before in the sense that whatever happens for one pair of orbits happens for all pairs of orbits. But in fact, what I realized late last night is that uh, actually this is not true, right? It's not true that whatever happens in the wandering domains also happens for the lifts in the unit disk and vice versa. And so uh, it's not true that what happens for one pair of orbits happens for all pair pairs of orbits. And in order to, uh, to see uh, how exactly this, this happens, we're going to consider the following uh, toy model, right? So take your favorite r greater than one and consider the annuli uh, going from, un let's write them like this, going from r to the minus two to the n, all the way up to R to the two to the N, right? So these are symmetric annuli uh, around the origin. And we are going to take, uh, right, so for N greater than or equal to zero. And we're going to take F, which is going to be a function that's always going to map one annulus into the next one. And it's going to be given by uh, sim it's simply z squared, right? So uh, essentially f is going to take a not our very first annulus into a n. And now what we want to look at is what happens to the distance between pairs of orbits on the unit circle, right? So uh, right now what we have is a nice symmetric annulus 
imagine that it's nice and concentric because I'm not really a dab hand with with a pen. And inside uh, this annulus sits the unit circle, right? So it sits somewhere in here. And we know that if we start on the unit circle, we're going to stay on the, on the unit circle forever as uh, the annuli grow around us. So now I, I would like you to consider that the distance between, uh, so the distance in AN between the orbits of uh, two points, let's say, oh, oh dear. Uh, sorry. So we're going to take two points Z and W sitting here on the unit disk. And we want to consider the distance in AN between Fn of Z and Fn of W, right? And this distance is uh, clearly less than or equal to, right? It's at most the length, right? So the hyperbolic length in AN of uh, the, the unit circle itself considered as uh, a closed curve that we traverse once. But uh, this curve here is always a geodesic of An. And we know that L of An of the unit circle is always 2 pi squared over the modulus of An, which is 2 pi squared uh, 2 to the n, the modulus of A naught. Which, as we all as we can all see, is going to zero as n tends to infinity, which means that the distance between pairs of orbits sitting on the unit circle is going to zero as we iterate f. But on the other hand, if we start with a pair of points on say this ray right here, then uh, because our function has no critical points inside any of these annuli, it's always going to be locally isometric. And so in fact, it's going to preserve uh, distances between any, pair of, uh, between any pair of points that we choose on this ray. And in fact, the same holds for any other circle that we take and for any other ray that we take, which means that actually uh, in this, uh, toy model, which isn't, which is actually uh, not a toy model at all. But anyway, in this toy model, uh, we have two transverse foliations of of our uh, original annulus. One of which is made of circles and is contracting. The other, and the other of which is made of rays and is isometric. And if we take points that are neither on the same circle nor on the same ray, then uh, they will get closer and closer together until eventually, but there's always going to be some distance between them, which, is, which should be given by uh, their distance, by the difference between their radii, right? And so actually what we see on this toy model is that uh, it's, it looks like some sort of potpourri of every, of the every behavior that we saw on on the simply connected case, right? And uh, I want you to keep this this toy model in mind because we'll come back to it uh, later. Oop. Okay, so now that we know that uh, there is more in there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in simply connected wandering domains, in terms of the, the hyperbolic behavior. What can you say about uh, the behavior relative to the boundary? Well, in this case, things are uh, more things are looking better for us, uh, but we still have to have to make some changes, right? Instead of considering the whole boundary, we're going to consider uh, the topological convex hull of our multiply connected wandering domain, which is essentially our wandering domain 
plus any of its bounded complementary components, right? So this is a, a simply connected domain. And we can actually show that for all points in Z, uh, either everyone's going to this outer boundary or no one's going to this outer boundary or everyone is oscillating between going to this outer boundary and staying away from this outer boundary, right? So here, at least things are more or less what they look like for simply connected volume domains. Now, uh, we'd like to talk about how internal dynamics relates to connectivity, uh, because actually we know that holomorphic mappings between say any line are far more constrained than mappings between simply connected domains because we have the riemann hurwitz formula. We have uh, the theory of covering surfaces if, uh, say, the degree is infinite or connectivity is too large, et cetera. We have rigidity theorems on the hyperbolic metric. We have uh, relations between the moduli of, of multiple connected domains that are mapped into each other by holomorphic functions. We have to consider subgroups of fundamental groups if our mappings are uh, unbranched coverings. And so everything is sort of kind of rigid. And so we can say that we can sort of classify most wandering domains from a dynamical perspective by considering their connectivity. So we see that um, if U has eventual connectivity that is finite, but greater than or equal to three, then uh, it's eventually isometric. So there's nothing to do and eventually, and eventually everyone's going to stay the same distance apart. If U has eventual connectivity two, then um, I want you to strike this out um, and replace this by the poopery that we saw before, right? So essentially, um, if the mapping has finite degree for all uh, takes one domain into the next with finite degree, then what actually what happens is that you mix every possible uh, behavior relative to the hyperbolic metric, which is something that never ever happens for simply connect wandering domains. And, um, but at least you know that it's eventually isometric if and only if uh, the moduli of UN form a constant sequence for a large N, right? So if your annuli sort, so if your wandering domain sort of stay the same size, then uh, you know that you're dealing with an isometry. And if your domain has no eventual connectivity, then uh, all we can say is that uh, it's going to shrink distances all the way to infinity. All, uh, but do such wandering domain exist? We're going to come back to this question uh, in a bit. Because first we want to talk about Baker wandering domains. Right? Baker wandering domains are um, wandering domains that behave like wandering domains of entire functions in the sense that everyone is bounded, everyone surrounds the origin for a large n, and they all go to infinity as n grows. Right? And we know that if a meromorphic function has a direct track d and a Baker wandering domain well, u, then uh, eventually all the iterates of u are contained in, in our direct tract D. So D is the only direct tract. And U behaves a lot like a multiple connected wandering domain of an entire function, uh, dynamically speaking. And so we actually have uh, that if we have a meromorphic function with a direct tract D and a Baker wandering domain U, then either it has eventual connectivity too, and U is not eventually locally isometric, but rather a as we saw before. And this is where that toy model that we saw before ceases to be a toy model because actually uh, you can standardize your, your orbit of wandering domains to uh, symmetric annuli and you get exactly the toy model we had before uh, with the only difference that you change the degree as you, as you go along, right? You, you iterate uh, different powers of Z, but essentially every Baker wandering domain of eventual connectivity two uh, looks like this this combination of uh, point orbits that stay the same distance apart, or get closer but then stop getting closer, or get closer and closer and closer until they sort of 
uh, crash into each other. And if the eventual connectivity is, of U is infinite, then uh, we don't know what happens. We can only say that uh, distances are decreasing all the way through. And now we, we finally, I want to come back to this question that we raised a couple of slides ago. Uh, do we have a wandering domain without a well-defined eventual connectivity? Uh, and actually, yes. Uh, we can construct a transcendental meromorphic function f with a wandering domain u the connect, such that the connectivity of its iterates oscillate indefinitely between one and two, right? So uh, if you want a, a picture of this, it looks sort of like you take a strip and then you uh, approximate an exponential mapping. So you take this onto an annulus. Then when you're on the annulus, you approximate a, a Zhukovsky mapping. Uh, so you turn this inside out and map it onto a disk. Then you approximate this function is going to take this disk and blow it up back onto a strip. Then you just approximate an affine map that takes this strip onto another strip. And then you start the whole thing again. Uh, and you can use it approximation theory to construct uh, a global meromorphic function with a wandering domain that does exactly this, right? And uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gustavo. And we can all thank Gustavo.